Welcome to the Judgment Call Podcast, a podcast where I bring together some of the most curious minds on the planet, risk takers, travelers, adventurers, investors, entrepreneurs, or simply mind boggers. To find all the episodes of this show, please go to iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or go to judgmentcallpodcast.com. For more resources, including how to become a guest, how to advertise, and to see all the lectures, podcasts, and books I would like to would like you to listen to or read, please also go to our website at judgmentcallpodcast.com. Like this show, please consider leaving a review on iTunes or like us and subscribe to us on YouTube. That will make it easier for other users like you to find us later on. This episode of the Judgment Call Podcast is sponsored by Mighty Travels Premium. Full disclosure, this is also my business. What we do at Mighty Travels Premium is to find the best travel deals for you as they happen. We do that in economy, premium economy, business and first class, and we screen 450,000 new airfare deals every day just for you and present the best based on your preferences. Thousands of subscribers have saved up to 95% on the airfare deals. In case you didn't know, Americans and Europeans can already travel to more than 80 different countries again, South America, in Africa, and in Eastern Europe. To try out Mighty Travels Premium for free, go to mightytravels.com slash MTP. If that's too much for you to type, just type in mtp4u.com, mtp for you.com to start your 30 day free trial. I'm here today with Stephen B. Smith and uh, Stephen has been teaching at Yale since 1984 and has been the director of graduate studies and political science and uh, director of uh, the special program for humanities uh, during his tenure. And Stephen is a very prolific author and uh, he's been writing uh, a bunch of books, including Hegel's Critique of Liberalism, Political Philosophy in 2012, and Modernity and Its Discontents. And his latest book is uh, Reclaiming Patriotism in an Age of Extremes, uh, which is now available for pre-orders. It's coming out next month on Amazon. Welcome to the Judgment Call podcast. How are you? Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Torsten, thank you for that, that lovely introduction. And uh, it's, it's a beautiful day in New Haven, so I'm delighted to be with you. Um, we are very happy to have you. Uh, we had some technical issues, but we finally uh, resolved them. And you look uh, very nice now, so I'm glad we got, we got this to work. Um, you know, I found you um, through your YouTube lectures uh, part of your uh, lectures, or I think all of them, um, you have to help me out with this, um, about political philosophy, um, have, had been published about 15 years ago, um, or recorded, or maybe later on published on YouTube. And um, I was wondering, um, first, of course, how does it feel to be a YouTube star? And second, um, how did that process happen? Was that a decision that you took? Was it a decision that Yale took to put your lectures on YouTube? <laughs> Uh, thank you for asking me that. Uh, first, I certainly don't consider myself a YouTube star by the standards of what YouTube stardom seemed to be. But that being said, uh, I'm very fortunate that those lectures came uh, on board online. And I'll tell you a little bit how it, how it happened. Uh, I had been giving my intro to political philosophy course for some time, can't quite remember how long. And I was approached by um, a friend who was in the administration who was in charge of these, doing these Yale courses online. And she approached me about do, putting my intro course online. And I said to her, maybe not in quite these words. I said, you must be out of your mind. Who, who would want to listen to this course online? I mean, it just, who, who, who would care? Uh, but she said that they were taking some pop, you know, popular Yale courses with lecturers and putting them online for not just Yale 
alumni and graduates, but for the general public. And I was a little, I was uneasy about it. I thought, first of all, if I put my course online, uh, then no one would take the course again. Uh, they, if they want to, they'd watch it online. Who, who would enroll, for, why would anyone want, want to enroll in the course? But okay, I decided to do it. And it was filmed uh, a number of years ago. And I have to say, it was one of the best things that's ever happened to me in as a teacher. Uh, first of all, it, it didn't deplete the enrollment at all. It had, uh, if anything, positive effects on, on my enrollments. But more importantly, uh, much to my surprise, people did watch it. Uh, they, and I, I still continue to hear from people all over the world, uh, of all ages, high school kids, uh, college students, uh, recent college graduates, senior citizens who are just looking for some, a little bit of lifelong education. I hear from them, they write me. Sometimes it's just, you know, thank you for your course. Other times it's to ask questions. Sometimes it's to pick a fight with something I've said. But it's just been wonderful. And I've, uh, if it's had positive uh, influence on people who want to study some of the great texts of political theory, uh, then I think it's, it's really been worthwhile. And I have to thank my colleague who suggested it to me uh, to put it online because it really has been for me and I hope for others a very beautiful thing. Yeah, no, it's, I think it approaches about a million views now. Um, and it's the one I found to political philosophy is a number one hit if you just type in political philosophy on YouTube. So that's, that's pretty stunning. Um, because your metrics in terms of engagement must be, um, also matching this. And, uh, it is a 24-hour lecture series, right? It's 45 minutes, about 45 minutes. And I tremendously enjoyed it. Um, I've been listening it last, uh, listening to it last year. And um, it, it really opened my eyes to the works of um, ancient and some more recent authors um, that I have heard of, but I never really knew what it meant, what they actually say. And I think um, I, I have to thank you for, for taking that step. Um, it, it definitely was a very eye-opening experience. I, and, and one thing that, that is hard, I feel, with, with these texts, because they are typically on the more complicated side, um, philosophy and political philosophy is hard to make sexy, you know? It's hard to bring into everyday people's minds, especially on YouTube, you know, 90% of the YouTube traffic is not like philosophy, uh, has, has as little as possible to do with it. What do you feel is, is your take? I mean. Is there a way to, there's obviously an audience for this, right? But is there a way to make philosophy more sexy? That's a, a good question. Uh, I've never quite, quite thought about it in those terms. Uh, my approach is to, and the, cor the course does, changes, uh, you, different versions of it were a little different. I. I do different books, but I, what I try to do is engage with serious books. Uh, always some Plato, you know, there's cer certain figures who are always there. I would say Plato, Machiavelli, and Tocqueville are definitely always there. And others check, sort of come in and go out, depending on what's happening or what I'm thinking about. But I really think the best way to engage people is to engage them with looking at serious authors and serious books. And here is a book. Trying to get people to engage with a book is, I think, the best way of approaching education. One of the things I would say, that one of the things I said that gets, seems to produce more, more letters to me and more emails than anything else is in my intro to Plato's Republic, uh, which is not at the very beginning of the course, but near the beginning. And I tell the class, uh, there is someone sitting out there in the class. Uh, you don't know who you are at the moment. Uh, I certainly don't know who you are. But in sometime in the future, in five years, 10 years, you are going to look back and you're going to discover that Plato's Republic was the most important book that you've ever read. 
and it is the book that you go back to again and again to enrich yourself, to answer certain questions, to examine things and that are going on in your, your life or in politics. I say something like that, and I'm shocked at how many people get back to me and say, I'm that person you're t you just spoke about. That's what the Republic has meant to me. And I would say that's something of the spirit in which I approach all the books in the clip. All the, all the authors in the books that I do, that this book that we're reading could end up being a life-changing experience. It could be the book that shapes the way you look at the world, the way you look at life, the way you, you know, it's, and so on. And I think if you just show students that these are serious works uh, to live with, to engage with, they're written, many of them, long, long centuries, even millennia ago, but they still have the ability to speak to our situation today and to help us understand ourselves. And I think that, to me, is the best way of, as you put it, making political philosophy sexy, letting people engage with it in a, in a, in a very existential, real way. Yeah, I think that's quite a prophecy that you did. You always said that. Um, and and I, I thought back about that the same day, at the same time and when I uh, listened to you the first time and I'm like, whoa, this is quite, you're building it up quite a bit, right? You, you, you're making people curious on one hand, but you're also raising expectations. And I actually just uh, read Plato this year, The Republic, and I felt well, what I was stunned about is a lot of, as you say, a lot of the questions that we every day um, um, see out there, moral questions mostly, right? they're basically on the same level as what, what Socrates and Plato um, talked about. Like, we feel of ourselves, and that is kind of the, the common theme. You're so advanced, I talk to my children. Um, they think everything that's 50 years old is from the Stone Age, and they can completely discard it. It makes no difference to their life ever. And then they are not in an age where they can discover this, but it, it, the amazing um, prophecy, and as you say that, is, you know, in moral terms, we are basically at the same level as the old Greeks and basically the same level as the Old Testament. And um, but before we go into this, I think this is a very interesting topic. Um, maybe this is also what attracted you into political philosophy or, or what was it that made you choose initially to A, um, take on this really difficult topic um, and B, um, what made you become a professor and teach at Yale? Yeah, that's, that would, uh, Torsten, again, thank you for that question. If I, if I were to answer that or try to answer it, it would take uh, probably all the time we have left. Uh, <laughs> Your, your lectures are only 45 minutes. We have that much time. So, so I'll, 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 just say, yeah. I'll just say, I'll just say a little bit uh, about, about how I got into this field and what, what, it, what it was that, that drew me into it. Yeah. Uh, political theory, when I started college, I started college in 1969. Uh, so you don't you, you 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 and your listeners don't have to do the math to figure out how old I am now so anyway I start I started in college in, in 69 uh, it was during the height of the Vietnam War uh, I was you know start college age 18 people were going to the army people were being drafted uh, it was a time of intense political debate and controversy uh, I had no background to speak of in political philosophy in high school. I didn't have anything like that. Even the term political philosophy was largely unknown to me. Uh, I took a class just sort of at random called Introduction to Social Theory, where we started with the Greeks and we did a number of things and, uh, you know, the Greeks and and I remember in the first day of the class, the instructor said, introduced himself and described himself as a social and political theorist. And I remember thinking at the time, I had no idea what those terms meant. <laughs> they didn't mean anything to me, a social and political theorist. But by the time the semester was over, for whatever reason, I felt for the first time in my life that was something I wanted to do. That was, it, it, the class 
you know, I, I remember very little about the class. But I do know it spoke to me in a way that uh, other things really hadn't in, in, that, in that way before. The first philosopher who really spoke to me uh, in a very powerful way and continues to do so, who I continue to teach uh, often, uh, was Rousseau. Uh, don't ask me why exactly. I think it was not so much the politics of Rousseau. In many ways, it was his language. It was almost the poetry of Rousseau. He's one of the most, as anybody knows who's read Rousseau, he's a vivid writer. He's a brilliant, he was a novelist. He, you know, he had a novelistic flair when he wrote, a vivid and novelistic imagination. And I had originally been thinking about being a literature major in college, so maybe that was part, part, partly it too. But Rousseau was the one who most spoke to me. And uh, I, again, I, it's hard even to say why exactly, but that's sort of what drew me in to political theory. Of course, at that time, being a professor was something I knew nothing about. Uh, I really didn't know. You know, being a professor, it was not something I, I thought about becoming. And like most things in life, we find out, uh, and this is also something a good novel can tell you, that most things in life kind of just happen by happenstance in a certain way. Very little in our life gets planned out in the way we expect it to. You know, so what happened? I, I, I did something that a lot of people did. I went to college and I studied what I did and then I thought people sort of encouraged me with it and I was interested in it. I went to graduate school and, you know, by that, by, you know, after a while you, you, get, a, you, you get a PhD and, and then you end up, I was very fortunate. I was, been, I've been very, very fortunate in my academic life. I mean, I've had some, but I've been very fortunate. I, I landed a, a couple of good jobs and I ended up at Yale in 1984. I've been here ever since. And uh, I've been very, very grateful for, to my teachers, to those who have helped me, you know, move, uh, move up and move ahead and learn what I've done. And now I'm in the position where I can pass some of that over to to new to students. So that's uh, there's a lot more, but I don't want to I don't want to bore you or your listeners with just talking about my my own biography here about or my own autobiography about how I got to where I am. But one of the things I do tell students uh, when I advise them is, I mean, you never know what a class is going to do for you. If I hadn't taken that class, you know, if I hadn't walked into that class, that introduction to social theory class, who knows, I'd be, I might very well be doing something completely different in my life. It was a kind of randomness in a way, but it was also something that touched me and spoke to me in a way that really ended up shaping my future and career and direction where I've gone. Yeah, I think that's great advice um, to keep that, 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 that power of being curious, that power of being able to discover things. And to an extent, I mean, I think young people, people struggle with this. They can discover your um, uh, lectures, but there's so many other things for them to discover, right? They, they struggle with just the amount of knowledge that's out there. And um, I think it's great advice, but they do this for a year and then they're like, oh man, I, I just ended up in this... Um, Kind of rabbit hole of flat earthers. Um, how do how do I get out of this? Because I've seen like I've seen things I shouldn't have seen. Let's put it this way. And not that I'm, uh, we should not talk about that. But you you get so interested and you go further into this rabbit hole. It kind of the reality kind of, kind of zooms out a little bit. Um, one thing that I was I was really curious, um, and you you mentioned that earlier. There's a certain ca canon that you use, right? You you start with Plato, then you go on to to, I have them written down because I don't know all of them, Aristotle, Machiavelli, and then you go to Hobbes, which I really like too. I just read that as well. Um, you go to Locke. Um, and there's Rousseau and Tocqueville and the one, the version that I saw, and you just said earlier, you, you changed that up a little bit. There's a couple of other um, um, 
philosophers or important works, I feel, like the Old Testament, uh, like Karl Marx's writings, that made a big impact on what people think of political philosophy. Um, I think in, in day-to-day work, we, we still are really formed, and this country was formed on the, on the, the works of the, the Old Testament and the New Testament, right, even if Locke has shaped that. Um, you, 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 there's a bunch of things that are pretty famous that you exempt from the, uh, from the canon. Um, why is that? Why, why are they not part of that? Well, the easy, I mean, yes, the easy answer to that question is that the semester is only 13 weeks long and there's only so, so much you can do in it. So every course is naturally going to be a matter of not only inclusion and exclu- but exclusion. Uh, many of the texts you mentioned, Marx uh, and others, are, are in fact texts I teach in other, in other classes. So, I mean, my intro class isn't the only class I teach. Yes. And I certainly don't want to give the impression uh, that the book, books I've selected for that course in any one version of it are somehow the only ones worth reading. I mean, the, the selection, I, I wouldn't say is arbitrary because there are, they are in many ways key and important books, but there are more key and important books to read than you, you can do in one term. Uh, I can't remember now exactly which version of the class you, you saw online, but I actually do use or I have used before uh, sections from the Bible, from especially from the Hebrew Bible, uh, is an important political text. I use the, the Life of David. Uh, we've read at, up to that point, for example, Plato's Republic, where you know they read up, students read about the philosophy, you know, the famous Platonic idea of the philosopher king. Uh, later on, they will read Machiavelli's Prince, his idea of the prince. Well, the, the Bible has a couple of extraordinary political figures in that I, want to, I wanted to throw into the mix. And, and one of them that I've, I focused on particularly is, da- is, is David and the story of David, whose rise to power, whose exercise of political power, who's the, es- the establishment of a kind of kingship in ancient Israel has elements of both Plato's philosopher king and also Machiavelli's prince. He's David as a complex and interesting study of, of leadership. Uh, and there are very interesting moral and, pol- moral and political struggles that he engages with both to achieve and to maintain power. So that's been, I, I do use that, uh, I do use the, the Hebrew Bible as in many ways a kind of interesting case study of, of political thought, political theory. Uh, since you mentioned Marx, uh, I, I want to say because I, I, do not, I did not use Marx in the class, uh, the class ended with Tocqueville. And that was a decision. I mean, uh, that was that was a decision. Why, why did I end? Why did I decide to end the class with Tocqueville? In part because it seemed to me that, and this again is is a decision, and we could argue about it. That in modern in our times in our in our times, democracy, uh, the theory of democracy, has become the dominant at least in the Western world, the dominant form of political organization. Uh, We're obviously at a moment where we're deeply, deeply concerned about the future of democracy, its fragility. Uh, It seems far more, in many ways, democracy seems far more fragile than it did even say 10 years ago when I put this course online. So if I were to offer it again, I'd have maybe have to think a little bit more about about how to end it. But at that point, at least, democracy and its future seem to be the, again, the, the dominant and most important kind of politics that we, we aspire to. 
and I didn't think anybody captured the democratic experience better than, than Tocqueville. Uh, his Democracy in America is not just a book about America. It's a book about democracy and what the democratic experience means for, I mean, he was, he was not writing a book for Americans. He did not think it was written in French. It was written for French, French people uh, where democracy had had a very rough beginning in the French Revolution. Tocqueville's writing in the 1830s and 40s. And he's asking the question that what, what, what form will democracy take in France and in Europe? And he's looking at America to find how, what, what, can, what can the French learn, learn from the American experience and, and, what, and also what, what, what is there to be avoided? So I did think Tocqueville was, was sort of the philosopher of, of the democratic experience. And that's why I... Uh, gave I ended the course with with was the last the last text I used. I mean, you could have used Marx. We could use Nietzsche. Many of my friends and colleagues elsewhere love Nietzsche and put Marx and Nietzsche in the mix, or uh, certainly sure. on, yeah. on Hannah Arendt or some twentieth century political theorists. But I've tended to use those for for later later classes. Yeah, I'm asking, um, you know, one hand, um, I'm, I'm, and I learned that from you, Tocqueville's experience in the U.S. as a, um, as a way more um, religious uh, way of experiencing life and using this as the underpinnings of daily life that then bubble up into a, a bigger structure. I think, and I fully agree with you, that was kind of our understanding of democracy for so long, but it's been going away. And, you know, I grew up in Germany and I... I um, I grew up a lot with Marxism. I grew up in in Eastern Germany, and uh, I, I I probably never understood what it was at the time, but I I I saw what it did to people, and I saw what happened to 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 totalitarian state, and. Um, it is something that that people I think emotionally, without knowing what it is, kind of kind of they they look towards it, right? They they see if this is something they can attach themselves to it, and. Um, it, it would be great for people to actually understand a what what Marx has been saying, and I'm still you know I probably have to have to find out your other lectures what ha he has been saying, and how is that what what happened with um, with the country that was built on this philosophy right It wasn't built on, on economics but it was built on a, on a political philosophy from the ground up or from the bottom um, from top to top down but still it was a completely redrawing of of how people organized themselves and it ended you know as we all know how it ended but it is this this idea of totalitarianism that may or not be attached to Marx um, actually I'm, I'm I have no idea if that's true do you think a Marx like country will always end up being totalitarian or that's kind of a fluke That's that's a that's a deep question. Uh, let me say it, it was it was more than a, an accident. It was more more than a fluke. Uh, I think the fundamental when I when I think about Marxism and the way it became institutionalized in Soviet Russia and in Germany and places like this. It's, it's flaw, which I think is something that runs deep, uh, in many ways, runs deep in the Western tradition. I mean, Marxism is not some weird aberration. It is a political philosophy with, with deep roots in the tradition of political philosophy. But its its flaw is its belief that in its its flaw is in its perfectionism, which is to say, it believes that somehow the perfect society, the just society, the equals, the free, just, it can be realized on Earth. Uh, you might say that that's a, a fallacy uh, that goes back to Plato. Or at least to a certain reading, a certain reading of Plato, I'm, that how to create the just society here and now, and the belief that uh, all of the hmm, how, how to say that the just society will answer all 
all human questions can be satisfactorily answered if society is just organized in the in the correct and proper way. And I think that is a powerful impulse in philosophy. I called it perfectionism. But it's an extremely dangerous impulse at the same time. I think the philosophers who attract me more, and I think in many ways are more, whose political philosophies are more humane and less prone to sort of tyrannies and totalitarianisms, are those that are more attuned to the imperfections of human nature, who recognize the fallibility of human reason, the fallibility and the imperfection of, of human beings, and that not all good things can be brought together and reconciled. And it's an awareness of the plurality of values. It's a recogni recognition of human imperfection and the limitations of our own reason and rationality that I think are at the core of the, the liberal and democratic theories that uh, I would oppose to Marx and other, other forms of per political perfectionism. Yeah, I think it, it happens, and, and I, I, f I see this now, you know, I, I, I live in San Francisco, do I, I'm not here full time. And what, what, what I see is that the, 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 the way people um, see the Old Testament primarily and the, young, the New Testament, I wanted to say the Young Testament, that would be interesting if someone comes up with that. Um, the, the way how far people are away from their perception of the Old and New Testament, especially the Old Testament, and the reality, of the, because they never opened the book, right? They never even look into it. And it took like Jordan Peterson, another YouTube professor, to, um, to really open that debate a little bit. But I think it, it's, it's still far away from people's um, a daily reading list, um, and because it is, a, as you describe, it is full of imperfect people who make a lot of mistakes, and as they go along, kind of find that higher calling, or at least they, it's being described um, in, a, in a very, um, in a very interesting way. Let's put it this way. But most people don't even get that far, right? They only know about a few rules from Deuteronomy, and that's where they close the book. Um, but they don't even get to Deuteronomy, right? They don't even read the chapters before that. So I found that a, a massive disconnect that may actually exist with Marxism too. That's that's why I'm asking so openly. Um, my, my my parents were Marxist-Leninists, right? But they weren't, um, you know, the hardcore um, as you would expect the were intellectuals and trying to find out is that system or can we can we create a system that's that close. Obviously, they came from the other end. They were like, okay, this is the theory, and now we kind of push people into this chain. One thing and that's that's a little more more to, to what you said earlier, and, and I feel you said it goes back to Plato, what people think about Marx. Um, when I read Plato, there's this, and his idea was the philosopher king, right? This is the perfection of, of, of life. We don't need laws. We need a philosopher king. Um, but isn't that a little bit every philosopher, because a lot, a lot of times philosophers, they are not like software engineers, they can't just code it and make a billion dollars, right? Isn't every philosopher kind of a secret philosopher king, and he wants like dictate other people what to do in their life, because, you know, that's how the world would be a better place? I always feel it's, if you get philosophers in a room, 90% of them want to be the king. Yes. I, I think you've put your finger on a really important issue uh, in political philosophy, which is the desire to rule. Uh, I would put it a slight, yes, uh, they, it's, not, it's not exactly that they want to be the king, uh, but the philosophers want to educate. Uh, you might say they want to educa educate the king. They want to be the, as it were, almost the power behind the throne in, the, in that respect. Uh, this is an old genre. Uh, it used to be referred to in the historical literature as mirror of princes. Uh, Machiavelli's prince is probably the most famous example of this, a philosopher giving a kind of advice book about, about how to rule to a political ruler. But in a certain sense, all political philosophy is something like that. It's addressed to, uh, if they don't there's not a desire to rule themselves, to, to educate a future generation of, of rulers. Yes, ab absolutely. And I think um, it is this connection between philosophy 
and politics, philosophy and political power that makes it not just an academic discipline, but we see how ideas actually and philosophical ideas actually enter the uh, political world. And, you know, take, Mar take Marx. You, we were talking about Marx just, just a moment ago. He said, here's a textbook case. He's a man who spent, you know, 30 years of his life virtually unknown, scribbling away in the British Museum, writing a book that when it was published in 1867, Capital, uh, had very few readers. And yet in the next century, Marx's ideas are dominant in a, in a huge portion of the globe. Who, who would have predicted that? How, how did that happen? Uh, and th that's what's true of Marx is true of many other things many other philosophers as well, whose ideas sort of enter the discourse, the popular discourse of politics and shape, truly do in many ways shape the, uh, the landscape of political ideas. We take another kind of ob example, Locke's, John Locke's influence on the American constitution and the American democracy is very is very evident he's not the only one but certainly the idea of rights Locke is the one who puts right the idea of, of right natural rights human rights on the table and talks about the right the importance of the right to property and the preservation of a certain kind of regime of rights I mean this is so essential to the American self-understanding it's not the only piece of it but it's a huge piece of it and in that way, you're absolutely right that philosophers uh, write not just to, you know, get tenure at some college or university. Obviously, not. They're right. They're these. These are people writing with ideas of truly shaping, uh, shaping the future. And and many of them, many of them did. Yeah, I feel like the the there is. Maybe an unspoken, um, would you say, that's been around for a long time, but there's an unspoken power thirst, so to speak. And in the, the age of polarization where we are right now, right, where, where you, you just need to be extremely polarizing, extremely um, aggressive on, on Twitter, on social media. And then if you build a social media on, or a philosophy on top of the social media, it will not be one that, you know, is kind to the other side. Let's put it this way. If you, if we create a philosophy in this day and we have a bunch of people on YouTube who are, you know, philosophers who are really good at this and we have people in the political parties, do you think the outcome of, of this current process where we are by definition, because otherwise you don't get the traffic on social media, we will end up with a, you know, very polarizing philosophy that will eventually take over? Or do you feel we will go back to, you know, what is more like middle of the, the road, what Locke said, what Hayek said, um, that are tied into economic principles, who, where you need the other side, where you need the other side, you need sellers and buyers. But I feel like in the in today's um, age, you kind of don't want the other side. You ban them from Twitter, like kind of what Plato said, right? They just don't even talk to people about other ideas, just give them the right ideas. Do you think that's something that happens with social media or it's just it's too, too fractured and will never take off? It's a great question. And I, I have to admit, I'm not really sure I have any, anything approaching an, an answer to it. Um, social media, I mean, it's while in many ways it's, it's all over the place, it's, it's sort of foreign to me, uh, <laughs> frankly. Uh, I don't really have a media presence. I, you know, it's not something to seek out. You know, but uh, and there's something perhaps, as you say, about the nature of, of the medium that attracts the most extreme platforms. It seems to reward the most extreme. It's a it's a it's a buck in the system, right? So in, in social media, the way the engagement algorithm runs and the way the AI is trained means you need a lot of um, engagement. That's often that's come, coming from your limbic system. So in order to be to be successful, and you see this with brands now, and social media political brands, they are extremely aggressive towards the other side, or so perceived other side, whatever whatever that means in that extent. 
And that's the only way to really get these, these engagements going. So there's, there's a reason they have become like that. And that's the reason the algorithm was written. And that's the only thing the algorithm can look at. So it isn't that these people gone crazy. They've just, you hear from a lot of crazy people. In many ways, uh, we talked about Marx a moment ago. In, in many ways, the philosopher who speaks more directly to the social media world that you're describing uh, is in fact another German uh, philosopher named Carl Schmitt, a uh, 20th century figure, who wrote an important little booklet. It was really very short, sort of like a long essay or a very short book called The Concept of the Political, in which he, in which the central concept of politics, he argued, was the distinction between friend and enemy. Politics is always about defining an enemy, someone who you're against. Uh, it was an extremely aggressive and militaristic idea of what politics is, that politics is always against somebody in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an engagement of struggle, conflict, and war. Uh, there's elements of Nietzsche in this. There are ele certain elements of Heidegger in it, too. He was an almost exact contemporary of Heidegger's. And that philosophy of friend and enemy, us and them, uh, the other, uh, the existential other, that very much describes, I think, the kind of social media world that you're, that you're, you're talking about here, Torsten, and captures a lot of, the, a, a lot of what's going on unfortunately, in, in, our, in our modern democratic politics. Uh, it's less about uh, toleration, these kind of liberal virtues of toleration, compromise, and awareness of our own fallibility, as it is determining who is the existential enemy and mobilizing all of our resources and all of our forces against that enemy, whether the enemy are foreign nationals, whether the enemy is considered to be ethnic minorities, immigrants, migrants, you know, there has to be an enemy. And that, that seems to be the, the philosophy of the social media world that you're describing. Yeah, when you when you when you look at Twitter, you get the the emotional impression. Obviously, you you can you think about it, but you get the emotional impression the world is going to come to an end like every single day, twice, and and that's and you but you you tell yourself, okay, next time I look at Twitter, I'm not I'm not going to be swayed by this, and you will be. I mean, I am at least right, and I consider myself relatively educated, so I feel like the 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 way the the authors on Twitter and the AI in, in concert are so convincing in that theme that it's hard to withstand that. I mean, I, I, you, you eventually get tired and you just block it out, but then you, you take a break six months later and you're like, whoa, I am still think tomorrow is going to be the end of the day. It's just, there's not much you can do. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about, and I, I know this is a difficult topic, I'm not sure you, you've been looking into this, but there's this ongoing debate, Jordan Peterson brought that up about the postmodernists, right, about Derrida and Jacques Foucault that brought these um, ideas, very socialist ideas of, uh, of any outcome is good and we, we, we have to really, um, we, we, we don't have to worry about what is a good outcome, what, what helps us morally, what helps us politically. Those and the, the, the kind, of, uh, kind of liberal idea that you let other people live, those are all bad ideas because there is a, an, an enormous amount of outcome, we just have to steer people. It kind of sounds like Marx, and, but the debate is, and that's what I wanted to get at, is those were actually not, and I can't find this in Derrida or Foucault. I wrote a couple of, of books. Um, what I, it's being ascribed to the Frankfurt School, more or Dorno. Um, another German, um, um, not so. There's a lot of stuff that came out of Germany that has, doesn't have the best impact in the world. We can start with Karl Marx and then we can start about the First and Second World War. I feel there's a lot of, um, Germany was ahead of its time, um, in the last century and exported a lot of, how do I say, really mean stuff. Um, that's kind of my, my, my own perspective. Um, obviously, we can. Uh, that's probably a big generalization. What do you think about the postmodernist debate? Have you thought about that? Is that something you've researched? I have. Yes, uh, I have. And uh, it was, uh, I would say, actually, I find it a bit passe right now. 
Uh, Postmodernism was a big theme of the 80s, the 90s, maybe even the early 2000s. You mentioned Derrida, Foucault. I mean, their, their names were everywhere, and especially Yale. The Yale School of Literary Criticism and Deconstruction was... D Derrida used to be a frequent visitor, guest here, here at Yale. Uh, I never met him, but I know he, he was here. Uh, frequently and and yet it seems to have i would say a bit it, it it's it, it's seems like uh, kind of rust has settled in on the on the on the deconstructionists and the excitement of of what it of the challenge that it it it, it had is is now is now is is now rather tired i think and if you call your book postmodern, I think you're you're now sort of. Uh, I, I think it would be considered rather rather passe in a way. It's it's been been over over hyped, over overextended. Uh, critical theory. I mean, which you might say you mentioned Adorno, uh, and uh, that that has a that's that's had a, a kind of revival in in a lot of different ways. Uh, critical theory, crit what's sometimes called critical race theory, which is uh, a big issue today in college campuses, as well as in public policy circles, uh, has been has been influential. Um, I don't really care for it. Um, but I would say uh, thinkers like Adorno and Habermas and others have retained a kind of, uh, uh, what to say, credibility uh, be more, more than those like, uh, well, who are we talking about, Foucault and Derrida, who I, who I do think are now rather, rather tired. I mean, I, others would disagree with me, I'm, I'm sure, but uh, I find their views very, very tired and passe now. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, probably good to hear. I'm not a, not a fan of the postmodernism itself, do I? I feel like there is a, a lot of good bits in their, in their, in their books itself, and I read them, and I think it's very interesting. I don't think if the whole idea as a general concept is something that I can work with, or that, that is even that what it's being described to the postmodernists on a political level, right? That, Maybe it's there, maybe it's not. I can't deduct from, from when I read it, but then there is a lot of people talking about that. So uh, maybe you're absolutely right. It's just, it's, it's a little over. It got overhyped and now it's just coming down from this, from this general hype. You know, one of the things that does impress me though, after I was just rather very dismissive of, of their views, occasionally I will look into, I'll, I'll just be pick up a book. I, you know, I have books by Foucault and others in my office. I'll pick, pick them up. And I, I'm impressed with them. I mean, in many ways, they're far more, like, it's perhaps not surprising, they're far more impressive intellectually uh, than, the peop the, than the hordes of people who've gravitated and sort of taken and popularized the, his ideas or, 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 the, or their ideas. I mean, there is a serious core to uh, Foucault's thinking uh, about domination, about uh, institutions, about total institutions and various kinds. His early, early work had to do with the creation of insane asylums, his kind of total institutions. I mean, it was brilliant. In many ways, it was brilliant. And you, you look at some of his stuff on this and the history of sexuality, uh, it's very power. You can see why it's important, but it's been so trivial. It's been so vulgarized and trivialized that I'm afraid uh, that it's just now it seems rather. Pa it all seems very passe. Yeah, that's what I meant earlier with with, with make philosophy sexy. I think. The, the, when you, when you think of Nietzsche and what happened to him during the Nazi time, right? I mean, he had a certain view on the Übermensch and, and that, that was something that came out of his own thinking and the way he, he perceived himself being isolated in society that had ruined how he saw the Renaissance, right? He, he felt like the Renaissance were only a couple hundred or a couple dozen people that you really needed and the rest of the people, well, we can forget about them because frankly, we have no history of them, right? So maybe he had a point. Obviously, it's very arrogant to say that. And, but from his point of view, from his ivory tower, 
it, it made a lot of sense, let's put it this way. But nobody understood him in Germany. Nobody understood him later on either. You probably have, but I mean, most people don't have the ability. And what I'm, what I tried to say, people find these themes that they can break down. Literally, they can put in 140 characters, 280 characters. And then this is the label that a philosopher gets. So I feel like a philosopher, if, if he doesn't become king, he often becomes, you know, the king of the next revolution, but, but, you know, out of context quotes, out of, because if, if you go back and say, oh, Plato even said that, then, you know, you, you kind of shut down the conversation with pretty much anyone who's never read Plato, and that's 99% of the population, right? That's what I mean. So philosophers can either rule or they can rule the next revolution, and that's quite powerful, so to speak, even if maybe that's not something they can, they can't steer it, but they kind of, they can, they can, they can uh, stir, stir discontent, let's put it this way. No, that's, that's true. Uh, and I think, it seems to me one of the one of the things that distinguishes the political philosopher from other other kinds of political writers uh, is they're not just writing for their moment. Uh, there's a, an important school of political theory that believes that all political thought is, in one way or another, a response to the immediate concerns of of the moment. They're writing in response to their immediate context. So the purpose, the, the way we study political theory, they say, is that we need to contextualize it, show that it's a response to the problems or the issues of the author's own time. Uh, there's truth to that. Uh, that's certainly true in some in some respects. I mean, when we take a figure like Hobbes, you know, of course, Hobbes is writing in response to the civil war that's going on in England in his time and how to reestablish political order. Absolutely. He's writing in response to a, to a moment. But also Hobbes and these other writers are not just writing for their time, they're writing for the future and they're writing to shape the future. Uh, one of the greatest uh, influences on Hobbes, in fact, was a Greek historian, Thucydides. Uh, a slightly older contemporary of Plato, Thucydides, who wrote the history of the Peloponnesian War. Hobbes translated Thucydides. Before he wrote Leviathan, uh, Hobbes translated Thucydides. And Thucydides said in the, in the preface to his book, in the, in the opening paragraphs or chapters of, of the book, he said, I don't write for the moment. I write this book, he said, as a possession for all time. I mean, what a claim, you know. He's writing this book as a possession for all time. Guess what? Clearly he Greek. Out to be, He's clearly Greek. Yeah. Yeah. He turned out to be right in a certain way. We still re, we're still reading him, just like we we still read Hobbes. So these these guys are not just writing for their moment and to address the issues of. They take the materials of their moment and they look at them and and they their their view is to, to shape to shape the future to shape to shape people who will be doing things long after they're gone but whose, whose wor their words will, will live on and, and shape future for good or, or, or ill, I have to say. So, yeah. I found I found the Leviathan very really interesting. You, you know way more than me, but what I found most interesting was actually the second part where he kind of, it's kind of a, almost like a, like a mathematical proof for the New Testament, right? He, he, he goes through like really small sections of the New Testament and says, okay, this is true because, and I'm like, whoa, how he, he, and a couple of entrepreneurs on the show, when I asked them about religion, they always say, well, you know, it's not proven, but it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So we can assume it works and let's see what happens, right? That's kind of the, the practical guidance to religion. And Hobbes was like, no, I can prove it's true and I know what happened and this is how it works. And I was really stunned. This is like almost the bigger section of that book of Leviathan. Hobbes, uh, one of, one thing you can say with certainty about Hobbes is that he did not lack for confidence. Yeah. He was absolutely sure uh, that he had the key to getting, getting it right about politics, human nature. And when he turned his attention, as you, as you po point out, the last half of Leviathan is, is about the Bible. Uh, it's, it's, it's about religion and the Bible. He had no doubt that he could uh, provide us with a, an airtight uh, understanding of what Scripture meant and how it can be used or should be used to 
come to the support of political order. Uh, the danger was always for Hobbes that uh, scripture would be used to uh, be a source of disorder, of uh, of encouraging people to uh, to disobey, and he wanted to to disobey the laws of the kingdom, of the kingdom to which they belonged. He wanted to show that correctly understood biblical truth and political order were actually compatible with each other and, and in a certain sense even required each other. It was an extraordinary work of, again, it speaks to the confidence of the man. You, have, you can't read it without smiling in many ways with Hobbes, Hobbes's beliefs about how we can reinterpret the Bible to come out, come out the way he wants it to. It's really an extraordinary feat. I thought so too. It reminded me of the Talmud. You know, you, you take a text that you take as complete, perfect, and divine, but you obviously want, uh, for certain sections, you want kind of the opposite interpretation. And you go through these two years of logical ideas, and then at the end, you're like, oh, the opposite is actually true. I just showed you in these 5,000 pages. But the text is still correct, right? It's just meant differently. I think this is what, what Hobbes kind of tried there. Uh, <clears throat> I think it was, uh, from, from my contemporary view, and I don't know enough, but it was very <clears throat> Excuse me. It was very literal, but as you say, it's, it makes you it makes you smile, and you're like, "Whoa!" He goes into I don't know where where was the location of Mary on a certain day, and I'm like, "Whoa!" This is really you. You have to go into this after just writing about how the whole society should be organized. That seems it's something. It, it kind of took for me. It took away the credibility a little bit because he took something that I felt like is open to interpretation, like the New Testament, especially. And he took it so literal. I'm like, that's that, that. It kind of shows me that you didn't, you don't have the whole picture. But maybe I'm seeing it wrong. Maybe he just wanted something else and kind of wanted to show his contemporaries that you can keep the Bible but still see it in a different way. Well, one thing that that always struck me, and I hope that 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 is the last question I have for the philosophers. But I have more other have other questions. Um, you know, I always feel like if, if you either become a philosopher or politician or a cult leader, like you start a new religion, those are the three career choices you have. And it's kind of, you said that earlier, it's kind of random which one delivers you, delivers you an opportunity, right? You start Mormonism or you become Karl Marx or you, well, I, I, you become a politician with actual real power, right? But I feel like the personality for bo all these are relatively similar. Have, have, has this struck you before? Have you, you felt like that's true or that's, that's, that's not correct? Uh, that's interesting. I would also add entrepreneur is something we, you okay, know, it's yeah. also another, another, it's another er area of, uh, of, of uh, you know, for ambitious, we're ambitious people uh, light, light out. Uh, I, I see your point, definitely. Uh, I, I think these, these all require, though, different personality types in, in a way. Uh, to be a cult leader requires a certain degree, I suppose, of charisma that you, you have to have to, to hold the cult together. Uh, Teacher needs to have a certain degree of charisma, also, but maybe not not in, in quite the in, not in quite the same the same way. It, it calls calls for different different set of skills too. Uh, you you need to be uh, you need to be careful, thoughtful. You know things that are not necessarily translatable into being a politician. You know, being a politician uh, is something that. Uh, I admire in people the ability to um, to lead, the ability to not only the ability to lead, lead the ability to serve in public life, and what draw what draws people to public life. Uh, certainly, people are attracted to power, but they also are attracted by a, a desire to serve and in their own ways, perhaps make, sounds naive maybe, but to make the world better in some way. Uh, we may disagree with what they think is better, but I think there is a kind of, uh, often, if not always, a kind of idealism that leads people into choose a political life. So I think these are, 
they draw on certain features, uh, common features, but each each one is draws out distinctive, makes distinctive personality types. Um, I'm not nearly extroverted enough to be a, a politician, for example. I mean, you really do need to be somebody who, uh, I'm more of a bookish person in a, in a lot of ways. So I, I've maybe found found the thing that, that work works best for me. Uh, other people love, just love the give and take of public life and they, they want to be with other people all the time and be challenging and be challenged and uh, I admire that, but it, it's not really, it's not, it's not really me in, in, in a way. And, yeah. and definitely, definitely not cult, definitely not cult leader. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's that seems that seems a bit of an upgrade, but you you can see this how this plays on social media now, right? The, the the mechanism has changed, and I always felt like if the old Greeks had real technology, like digital technology, a lot of the Greek writers would have become entrepreneurs, and they would have built technology and they would have landed on the moon, right? Um, but they didn't have that. So what do you do if you have all these ideas going on in your head? Like Nietzsche, you know, you have these people talking to you and then you, you, he's, he wrote the Thus Spoke Tharasustra as, as a way to kind of, it's his personal cult leadership Bible, right? This is his, um, his way to write the Quran in a, in, a, in a poetic way to attract people to his train of thought. Extremely complicated, but he was hoping for a bigger audience. I'm just saying, if you don't, we wouldn't have technology these days we would be in more trouble because we would have more people go bringing these ideas in philosophy out there. And some of them, you know, would, would get a huge following and might be pretty aggressive. So maybe technology saves the day again because it makes technology, it makes philosophy more mellow. That's what I'm trying to say. We have social media, which makes it polarized, but in the whole technology makes it more mellow. More people have time to, you know, become what they do. In, and they don't have to be Karl Marx. They don't have to make everyone miserable just just because they want to live their life and with the, with the public attachment of their name. Well, one of the things, just to build on something you just said or thought thought that I had in response to it, is that uh, one of the things that impresses me very much about Socrates, if we want to go back to, to Plato and, and Socrates. Socrates was always deeply aware that teaching was always something that was directed to individuals and would have resisted uh, the idea that he would have a big public megaphone that would address huge crowds and mobilize people and to, to lead them. Teaching was something, that's why you see in the dialogues, he's only just talking to sometimes just one person, sometimes a handful, like in the Republic, you know, maybe there are nine or 10 people, only, only a handful of them actually speak. Uh, because he understood something that philosophy was something that was very personal. It was something that could only be, he was, Socrates never wrote anything. He thought it was something that could only be carried on in conversation and speech. And it was tailored to his speeches were always tailored in a way to the people who he was speaking to. Uh, there's an entire platonic dialogue called Phaedrus, uh, which is about writing and the dangers of writing because you write something and then it's out there. You, you have no control over it, it, it anymore. You don't know whose hands it's going to fall into, what use will be made of it. Uh, but Plato wrote, uh, Socrates didn't. And of course, Plato's writings are out there. We, st we still read them. But Plato seems in writing the Phaedrus to have been aware about the dangers of writing where his own teacher, Socrates, refused to write. Uh, there's nothing written by Socrates. Uh, it was all in conversation because he knew something about philosophy was something deeply private. Uh, maybe not just something you carry on in your own mind, but with 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 a few with a, with with a handful of people, a few friends, a few a few people. It was something that you cultivate in this in this way, and uh, in many ways, the culture that we live in today of loud of media technologies and speakers and megaphones and 
so on, uh, to, to the kind of thing I did for my class, putting it online, uh, very much goes against, I mean, there are many benefits to it, but it, it sort of goes against the spirit of Socrates, who thought that philosophy is something that really is, has to be done sort of one-on-one, -on -one, almost in the way that an analyst, a, 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 an analyst deals with one, you know, you deal with one patient, I guess there's something called group therapy, but you know, for the most part, an analysis is is one on one, and I think Plato was very much of that opinion. Yeah, that's interesting, and I, I never really thought about that. That's an that's a that's an enormous foresight um, that Socrates had at that point. I think there is a lot to it, but but as you said earlier, the the experience, you know, you, you we wouldn't be able to. I mean, as a, as a philosopher, I think it's hard enough because you you start from scratch. I feel like if you if you go into software, I, I code a lot of my own software. It's so much easier because I can I can use the last one hundred years of work, and I don't have to do I don't have to pay for it. Right? It's right there for me. I buy it on my MacBook, and then I download a bunch of software frameworks, and then I go into GitHub, and I have millions of other people's work that I can use for free, and it's. It's it's right in that stack, right? I, I can just layer some something on that last stack of of technology, and it can still sell it as my own, and and nobody will even worry about that. This is ninety nine percent not mine. It's been done by people during the last hundreds of years, maybe with a patent, very often with, with without a patent. In philosophy, I feel is you kind of start from from zero. Like you cannot assume that everyone. Maybe that's what Socrates already knew. You cannot assume anyone knows the books you were inspired from. You cannot. You cannot say maybe the Bible you can reference, but even that becomes a real problem these days. You, there, there's nothing that other people really know, and you start from scratch. Right? You have not these other layers of two thousand years of human civilization that you can rely on because. Most people don't have any exposure to it. Maybe they have some implicit exposure. And I always felt this is the philosopher's curse. Um, he, the, the good news is you can just out of your, out of your own gut, you can create the world and you can put your lens of philosophy on it. But you start from scratch and you have to really educate people f below, I mean, what Socrates even achieved, right? And that was such a long, two and a half thousand years ago. Um, I think there's some implicit learnings, but still 99% of when you go to a random person on the street, I don't know if you do these experiments or just go out and, and, and greet random people on the street and try to give them like, I don't want to say the lecture, but a five minute philosophy introduction. Most people will say, okay, thank you, walk away and never think about it again. I feel, maybe, maybe you have a different impact on people, but that's my impact. And this is the philosopher's curse. Maybe Socrates knew this or not and said, you know, it, it really doesn't matter if you write it down because nobody will, people will read it, but the, the chance that you randomly find people who read your work, even if very if you're very successful and as more smarter you get, probably as smaller as your audience, that is, I call this the philosopher's curse. Do you think that's true or that's, that's, that's an exaggeration? I think there, there, I think there is a lot of truth in it. Uh, again, let me just, your, your, your comment uh, made, made me, Think because Socrates famously uh, conducted his philosophy in public. Uh, He's, I wouldn't say he just went up to random people on the street, but okay. he, m most of his conversations were not with other philosophers. They were with people who were, were not just ordinary people, but they were not philosophers. And that's the way it was philosophy done it in public, uh, and it wasn't based on have you have you read this, have you read that, how learned are you? It was based on just directly confronting a problem, a question: what is justice? What is courage? What do you what do you mean by what do you mean when you talk about courage? What do you mean by that? Uh, what do you mean by beauty? What do you mean by love? You know, the dialogues have a kind of directness where they will just take a, a real issue. And and just sort of explore it from many from many different sides and with di and with different kinds of people, each one of the characters in the Platonic dialogues, everybody, even the dullest ones, bring bring something to the table. You know, they have an opinion, a point of view, a perspective. We might say they bring it to the table, and it gets examined and often often discarded, but it's, it's, some, it's something important. So there, there's a, there is a kind of democratic side to what Socrates understands by philosophy. It's, in, it's actual engagement with people who, uh, who, who, want to, who, want to, who want to converse. 
Yeah, I was about to say the other people in, in, in Plato's Republic don't really get to say much. But I was like, well, where does this monologue actually start and where does it end? I couldn't read it. Maybe I'm, I'm just not, not good enough a reader or not like specific enough. Um, I, there's one more thing that's, that's, a, it's maybe a technical question, but I think it's really relevant. I'm, and I read this from, from Hayek or Hayek. He, he, um, makes the, a lot of these references to the rule of law. And uh, I studied law. And when, when I asked people, what is the rule of law? They say, well, those are the rules that are, became law, right? Those are the laws of the United States, or these are the laws of Germany or whatever country you're in. And when you, when you, when you go back, and I had a couple of um, uh, interviews with, with politicians, they would say, well, democracy and the rule of law, these are the most important things in the world, right? Beyond that, if you don't have that, we don't even have to think further. And two things that I immediately noticed, and I, I couldn't talk about them, is A, Hayek has a very different idea of the rule of law, from my point of view, you know better. And B, what I always feel this is very strange, we, we assume democracy in lots of countries who had no experience with democracy. They're not Greeks, they don't have Greek heritage, they don't have the New Testament, Old Testament heritage. And we, we assume, well, rule of law in the way we define it, which is, I think, wrong, and then democracy are the two things they need before we can even talk about developing this country. I think we have it wrong. What do you think? Well, I, I do think you're, you're right or your, your interlocutor was right about the centrality of rule of law. Uh, we're very, very fortunate to live in a society in which rule of law has been, uh, I want to say, sort of baked into our political DNA, even from earliest times. Where, why? Uh, it comes in part from the English tradition of common law, which was an important part of the American founding experience. But it also is in, in you know, our conception of rights and privacy and private rights are also central to, to these ideas of law. And if you don't have the rule of law, we could talk about what, what is the rule of law. Uh, I'm not sure my computer is going to last long enough for that. But uh, I, I think, you know, I'm not, I'm not really sure about Hayek, but um, I, I just don't, don't know him, him well enough to have an idea of what, what, what exactly he means by, by, the, by the rule of law. Uh, his, his reference are, was the, well, from, they are the conditions. Yeah. I would, I would say the kind of conditions under which we under which we live. Yeah, his reference was it's kind of a meta law. So it's not just the, the formulated law. It's this understanding of there is we we define rules of laws. And it was about mostly about the rules of um, the, the protection of minorities, right? That's always the problem with democracy and the rule of law. You if you have more than fifty one percent, you just make uh, that's what happens. In, like in Africa, a lot you make the laws that are basically good for you and everyone else. You just you just define out of the problem, and these people never get anything and they can't do anything. And he was like, so this understanding this meta rule of law is what people have to learn first. Otherwise, it's no use to make any laws and there's no use of democracy because the majority will just drive away the minority and this will continuously be a battle forever. Um, hasn't really happened in the US, but I feel we see this right now that we have these states that extremely go polarized and once you have someone from the other side, he basically rolls up his sleeves and just um, disadvantages, so to speak, the other side, which I don't think was the idea of democracy in the first place. Maybe it is. To me, I, I, and I'll just go back to sort of where we began the conversation when you asked me how I got interested in this business, and I said that Rousseau was one of the first thinkers that came to me. Now, it may not, it, it may not be self-evident to everybody when you think of Rousseau and rule of law, but I think when Rousseau, in his most famous political book, The Social Contract, talked about what he called the general will, which is the most important concept of his most important political book. He's really talking about what are the conditions for the rule of law. And when he calls the general, when he speaks about the general will, he says any law to be a law must pass the test, must be able to pass the test of generality. What does he mean by that? A law can't just specify particular individuals Either, either to exempt them or to, to indict them in some way. The law must apply impartially to everybody. 
generality suggests impartiality. Law must be impartial. It must be applied to everybody. You cannot make yourself, that's why we think nobody's an exception to the law. Trump thought, sort of thought he was clearly. But the law, to be a law, must apply to everybody, to the rulers as well as the ruled. And Rousseau was deeply aware of this uh, in his conception of the general will with its emphasis upon impartiality. And, and the, formal, the laws are forms. That is to say, they don't specify specific things, but they just specify the conditions under which we act. They specify the formal rules under which we act. They don't tell us what to do, but they spe spe specify the rules under which we you know, under, under, under which we act. And I think he, in many ways, gave one of the most profound insights into, into the rule of law in his famous book, The Social Contract. I know that's not always the way the social contract is read. Uh, people often think of Rousseau and they think he's the precursor of the French Revolution and a lot of very bad stuff. Maybe, maybe not. But I tend to think of Rousseau as a great philosopher of law and we talked about rule, the, the importance of the rule of law. So that's where I, I would go. Uh, I guess I have to read Rousseau finally. I haven't undertook that, I haven't undertook that venture. Uh, let me, before, we, before you go, and, and your phone is, is out of battery, tell us more about your book. And I know you, you've just had an essay in the Wall Street Journal. Um, you, you've been thinking a lot about patriotism and the role of patriotism, um, what it will um, be like, because patriotism is this word now. We, and I, I was, the first time I really heard this is uh, suddenly I got, um, early January, got a lot of messages. Are you really a patriot? This, this is what the patriots are up to. And this was a big thing about the capital. Um, what does patriotism, I guess, mean? And what, 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 what is the book about? Thank you for asking me that. Uh, yeah, I, uh, the patriotism book actually, well, I won't go into the whole story about how, how it came about, but it's an attempt to reclaim, it's called reclaiming patriotism in an age of extremes. It's an attempt to explore what this term means for us today. And if I can put it, I'll put it this way. Uh, Patriotism, I argue in the book, uh, one, of the, one of the central arguments that runs throughout the book is we need to understand patriotism. Let me, let me stand back a second. Aristotle, who figures in my intro course, Aristotle famously argued that all the virtues, he says, are midpoints between an extreme, between two extremes. So courage, he says, is a midpoint between cowardice on the one side and being excessively rash or bold on the other side. It's finding, it's finding the right point. And I want to argue that patriotism is a virtue much like that. Patriotism stands between two conflicting and competing alternatives, which I talk about briefly in that Wall Street Journal piece that you referenced. One on one side is the tendency towards what we call cosmopolitanism. We want to be, there's a lot of talk about being citizens of the world, being uh, that, the, that, the, that the state is now being transcended by new forms of political organization like the EU and other kinds of transnational forms of organization. And that the old idea of being a citizen of a state is now we are now citizens of the world. We are, we are now all cultured cosmopolitans on the one side. On the other side, which is closer, is nationalism. The idea which is increasingly dominant in many parts of the world, in, in, including the U.S., is that our national identity shapes who we are. It shapes our minds, our hearts, our souls. And we, we are a little bit like in that world that I described with Carl Schmidt. You are a member of your nation, and to be a member of a nation is to be put in opposition to members of other nations. It's a world of antagonism and, and conflict and war. And these are the two extremes. Patriotism is a kind of love of country. Uh, 
But it's different from both the nationalist who sees him or herself in opposition to all others and the cosmopolitan who says, well, I'm, I'm, not re I, I'm just maybe here, but I'm really, my loyalties are to humanity at large, not, not to my fellow citizens. But the patriot, and I'm really it's telling me I've got 5% left. The patriot's love of country is a form of loyalty but it's loyalty based on a kind of love. It's loyalty based on a kind of respect and tolerance for others and for a belief in, in the uh, dignity, I guess I would call it, the dignity of one's own and the value of one's own country and, and way of life. It's a little bit like being a member of a family. You love your family doesn't mean you believe your family is better than any other family. It doesn't mean that your family is going to be in conflict with other families. No, you, you love your family sort of because it's yours and your family. It has a special part in your, in your heart and your mind. And I try to, and, I, and the book is trying to defend patriotism. It's, it's something like that, that love of family that I've just described in distinguishing it from both the nationalist disposition as well as from the cosmopolitan. That sounds really interesting. I think the, 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 uh, the, the, um, the real identity, the real meaning of the word patriotism is something that, that has been um, probably abused by both sides, so to speak. It hasn't, it hasn't been something that you can align people behind anymore. Maybe that was true 20, 30 years ago. And I always feel like the, the, the real patriotism if, if it is becoming re redefined, as you say, and that that would be that would be a great advancement, I feel. I think America is looking for a crisis. That's kind of my gut feeling. Where America is looking for a crisis to come together at, or maybe split apart, whatever the solution is. But we didn't have enough of a crisis to define ourselves. There's no Soviet Union anymore. There hasn't been a big challenge to to us anymore. And we kind of we are we are hacking ourselves apart in this uh, mini civil war that we are fighting right now. And maybe patriotism is what really binds us all together. Maybe maybe we can we can use this as a as this binding clue if. if if we still have it, right? Um, sometimes I'm not convinced it's still there. Uh, well, that's the aspiration of the book. And I, I would say, if, if I can quote Tommy Lee Jones from the great movie, no Coen Brothers movie, No Country for Old Men, uh, if we're not in a crisis now, it'll do till the crisis comes. Yeah, <laughs> let's, let's hope not. Let's hope we can avoid it. <laughs> Stephen. Thanks for doing this. I know you have to go. I, I know you have to go. Thanks for doing this. I really appreciate it. Thanks for your time. It was, it was my... I'm sorry we got off to a rocky start with the technology, but I loved it. Thank you for your questions, and I really appreciate your, what you're doing, the work you're doing. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Same here. It was really my pleasure. And I hope we see you again. It would be my pleasure. Bye-bye. Have a good one. Bye.